Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to what's going to be, I think, yeah, I think a very exciting couple of days. Um, conference on Information Theoretic Interpretations of Quantum Mechanics, bringing together philosophers and physicists, some physicists who work in foundations, some who, who don't. For those of you who have not been um, to events like this, ground rules are Everybody here knows something about quantum mechanics, but what we know about quantum mechanics may differ from to person to person, so try to, um, and um, the language that people use might be a little bit different from field to field, but uh, my experience is everyone seems to manage to um, understand each other. Um, the occasion of this conference is the publication of this book, Banana World by Jeffrey Boob, um, if you haven't already read it. Um, Pick one up for the plane ride home. Uh, well, it's a, but um, it's recently come to my attention that um, we're coming up on another significant anniversary. Um, in July, um, 50, years to, 50 years ago, in the July issue of Reviews of Modern Physics, a very seminal paper was published. Um, John Bell's um, it's his first paper even though, uh, on, on hidden variables, even though it was published um, second. And in the very same issue, who knows what was in the very same issue? <laughs> yes, in the very same issue, um, uh, um, a couple of papers by um, someone you may have heard of, David Bohm, and someone else you may have heard of, Jeffrey Foo. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, are these your first published papers? Yes. So we're celebrating 50 years of Jeffrey Boob's um, <laughs> contributions to the foundations of quantum mechanics. And um, Jeff has been very influential um, in a number of ways in the uh, uh, discussions on foundation of quantum mechanics, and I'm not going to try to go into them. But relevant to our purposes today, he was among the first to really get excited and interested in quantum information theory. In fact, in, in, in particular, there's a paper he published back in 2000, and um, um, for me, that last line of the abstract is a memorable one and sort of sing signaled and helped initiate a shift in how people were talking about quantum mechanics. Um, he says he's, he, he's going to show briefly how recent work on quantum information over the past 10 years, this is in 2000, um, has led to a shift of focus in which the puzzling features of quantum mechanics are seen as a resource to be developed rather than a problem to be solved. And in an intervening um, 16 years, I think people have really become aware of how much the, what, these puzzling features can be regarded as a Okay, um, so without, uh, um, don't want to take up too much of your time, but before you, uh, we, we start, I just want to make a shameless plug. Um, there are physicists here, there are philosophers of physics, and some of you have published papers in philosophy of physics, and I would just like to respectfully suggest that you please keep in mind studies in history and philosophy of modern physics when you do so. We have two of the editors, Two out of three of the editors here in the room, Gaden Glademan is there in the back. If you want to talk to us about the journal, um, then please um, do so. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Richard Healy. Richard Healy has also had a substantial and seminal career in the philosophy of quantum mechanics. And um, you can hear <coughs> here's Richard. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to kick off this really interesting workshop. Um, and I'll start with uh, my history with Jeff and this institution. As a first semester PhD student, uh, I trekked from Boston to Western Ontario by Greyhound um, to attend my very first conference in this field. Uh, and Jeff was here teaching at that time. And it was a seminal experience to, to meet Jeff and to participate in this conference. Um, and I was also very proud to be able to get back to Boston afterwards when the other speakers were unable to leave because the airport was shut down because of a snowstorm. Um, <laughs> OK. Uh, so what I want to do is compare my recent thoughts on how to understand quantum theory 
um, with Jeff's. So I won't be looking at all of the fascinating details in Jeff's book, which I have read with great interest and from which I have learned a lot and expect to learn a lot more. Um, instead, what I want to do is to focus on sort of big picture issues, and in particular to point out some uh, issues on which Jeff and I agree against a lot of other people in this field, and then focus on some of the things on which I think we still don't agree. Um, okay, so Jeff has offered an information theoretic interpretation of quantum theory. I tend to say quantum theory rather than quantum mechanics to include quantum field theory and all, everything else um, that's quantum. Uh, and I take what I call a pragmatist view. So here's some points of agreement to begin with. They're all negative points of agreement in the sense we agree that something is not right. Uh, the first one is that uh, the state vector or any mathematical representative of the quantum state um, uh, is not abeable using Jeff Boob's term. Sorry, <laughs> wrong Jeff. <laughs> um, using John Bell's terminology. And nor, however, does it represent our knowledge. People tend to focus on the question, what does the state vector represent? I think that's not the right question to be asking here, actually. Uh, and perhaps you'll see why as we go on. So that's the first point of agreement. Uh, we both agree that currently popular so-called realist interpretations misinterpret quantum theory, uh, including Baumian mechanics, and at least in the case of Jeff and me, um, Everettian approaches. Um, and if you call physical collapse approaches like GRW or Perl or Penrose, if you call them interpretations of quantum theory, then um, they also, we think, uh, miss the point. Uh, thirdly, I think we both agree that Cubist and other, I've written instrumentalist interpretations are inadequate. I've written that, but I've just looked at um, Rudiger Schack's um, abstract, and he says that um, no, quantum Bayesianism is a form of participatory realism. So terminology here gets a little confused. Um, okay, now here's uh, another point on which we agree, and this is a positive point. Quantum theory is about probabilistic correlations. So we agree on that, but we don't quite agree on what probabilistic correlations are. And, and that's what I'm going to start off by explaining. Well, quantum theory successfully predicts lots of probabilistic correlations, including these, which Bell famously said, cannot be explained without action at a distance. I'm sure you've all seen this quote. And those correlations arise as experimental manifestations of the probabilistic violation of Bell inequalities by entangled states like this Bell state. So what is probability and what's its relationship to statistical data? Reading this quote from Bell, I puzzled a lot about what he meant by realizable. Um, now, one thing he might have meant was that at the time he wrote this, which I believe was in 1981, the particular correlations he was talking about had not been experimentally realized. Of course, they have been in spades since then. Um, but perhaps when he met, said realizable, he meant somebody could do an experiment that would produce these correlations. But if you think about it, what is it to realize a probabilistic correlation anyway? Um, the introduction to Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern begins with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern playing a game, and Rosencrantz, uh, I think he's the one, perhaps it's Guildenstern, tosses a coin, and uh, Rosencrantz has to bet on where it's going to come up. And he bets heads. Flip, heads, flip, heads, 92 times. He's right every time. Is that a manifestation or a realization of a probabilistic correlation, perhaps not correlation, a probabilistic phenomenon um, involving a fair coin? Well, it's compatible with uh, a fair coin, uh, a coin being fair that it land 92 times in a row, heads, but does that count as a realization of that probability? It's not exactly a manifestation. A manifestation would expect to uh, give you statistics that are pretty much 50-50, and that one clearly did not. But it's compatible with the coins being fair. Probabilistic correlations, I think, are probabilistic phenomena, and they may be manifested by statistical data whose frequencies closely match the model's probabilities. But the important point is that a probabilistic phenomenon is neither constituted nor determined by data that manifests it. It's sort of floating above at a more abstract level. We use probability to model statistical phenomena. 
uh, the statistics don't determine the probabilities. So that's the rejection of a frequency, an actual frequency interpretation of probability. Okay. Now, Bell's particular correlations are an example of what Jeff calls new sorts of probabilistic correlations that are structurally different from correlations that arise in classical theories. And that's a key element in his defense of his view that quantum theory is about the structure of information. Um, he tends to call these non-local correlations. I think that's a bad way of describing them. They're non-localized correlations. They are correlations among events that occur in different space-time locations of types to which the, the Bowen rule assigns probabilities. Um, talking about non-local correlations starts people thinking about spooky action at a distance and, and, and um, causal connections. And all we have in the probabilistic modeling of the data is correlations between non-localized events. Okay, so now here's where I begin to differ, I think. Every application of the Born rule to a quantum space specifies probabilistic correlations of a different kind, namely between conditions backing assignment of that state and values of magnitudes whose probability the application specifies. So when I say that quantum theory is about probabilistic correlations, that's the kind of probabilistic correlation I mean. Correlations between backing conditions and magnitude claims. Those arise even in applications of the Born rule, which gives you individual probabilities rather than joint probabilities. Okay, now Jeff draws an analogy between quantum theory and relativity. Uh, and I don't quite see this analogy, but perhaps um, I will do after this workshop is over. I'll tell you what I think at the moment. Um, I won't read that quote, it's right up there on the slide. What does relativity tell us about relations among events? It tells us in relativistic kin kinematics that we need to change how we represent spatiotemporal relations between events. What about quantum theory? Well, quantum probabilistic correlations don't change how we represent relations among events because they concern probabilistic phenomena, not directly the events that manifest them. Remember, probabilistic phenomena are more abstract than statistical data. And the probabilistic correlations in quantum theory uh, don't concern relations among events, um, except in this indirect way by modeling the statistics which we get when we investigate uh, events that manifest those probabilistic correlations. Okay, a more substantive uh, issue, I think, is this one. Jeff thinks, um, von Neumann was exactly right to say that quantum probabilities are perfectly new and sui generis features of physical reality. I don't, uh, because quantum probabilities are not features of physical reality. They're not beables any more than the uh, quantum state or representatives of the quantum state are beables. They're floating at this more abstract level in our modeling of um, actual events. However, they are objective for all that. There's lots of objective stuff in the world that isn't <coughs> physical stuff, not directly. Um, okay, so now let's talk about probabilities. I said what I say, think about probabilistic correlations and how that differs, I think, with what Jeff says about them and believes about them. Um, if we want to understand probability, one place at least to begin is looking at what the philosopher David Lewis said about it. Um, as you'll see, this is only a beginning. I'll div diverge from Lewis pretty soon. He distinguished two concepts of probability, and he called them credence and chance. And he related the two by his famous principle principle, a principle which he took to capture all we know about chance, the more objective of these two uh, concepts of probability. Now, he thought that chances other than zero or one exist only in indeterministic worlds, such as that he took to be portrayed by orthodox quantum theory. So there's no chance in um, games of chance or in statistical mechanics, or there wouldn't be if classical physics were true. Um, but there is in a, a genuinely indeterministic quantum world, according to Lewis. But I think that born probabilities, though they are objective, are not Lewisian chances. Their relation is more subtle to Lewisian chances than that. Some of them come close. None of them are actually Lewisian chances, and I'll tell you about the ones that come close soon. 
So this is an important point, which is why it's out there in red. The function of probability, why we have that concept in the first place, the function is to provide a physically situated and therefore informationally limited agent with good advice on how strongly to believe statements about events to which he, she, or it, there's nothing human about this, has no informational access. That's why there is a concept of probability. So for a pragmatist like me, who uh, thinks that what I just said was important, uh, what I'm going to call modified Lewisian chances lie at one end of a spectrum of objective probabilities. And each element of this spectrum corresponds to a different substantial limitation on the information physically accessible to a situated agent. I mean, crudely speaking, what Lewis has done is focus on a particular um, informational barrier uh, faced by a physically situated agent. If Newton had been right, that uh, agent, in principle, could have known by observation anything about the past, but nothing about the future. That's the initial intuition. Um, but that's only one kind of informational barrier. Um, physically situated agents have all kinds of problems getting access to information about the world. Uh, and the mere fact that something has yet to come is not the only barrier that they face. So now I'm going to talk about how we need to modify David Lewis's principal principle in order to square it with relativistic space-time structure. So here's a picture of the light cone. And for Lewis, chance, the objective uh, concept of probability, uh, was always to be relativized to a time, which is fine if there is such a thing as a time, as there certainly was in Newtonian um, space-time. But in relativistic space-time, we have to be a little careful about what we mean by a time. Um, and the natural way to modify Lewis's principle is to relativize chance not to a time, but to a space-time point, an idealized location of a physically situated agent. The same idealization that we uh, use all the time in relativity, where we think about an agent uh, being, or an observer, being represented by um, a time-like world line, and a particular point on that world line indicating where the agent is at that point. So here's the principle. The chance that A, for any proposition at space-time point O, conditional on any information H O about the contents of O's backward light cone, satisfies this equation, which is implicitly defining the term on the right, the modified Lewisian chance of A. What that equation says is that the chance determines the rational credence of any idealized agent situated at space-time point A in proposition A, conditional on any information whatever, H O, about the contents of space-time point O's backward light cone. So I'll come back to uses of that. And the idea is going to be that we can use born probabilities to give us chances. But when we do so, we'll learn something very interesting about chance in a quantum world. So now I'm going to talk about quantum states. And again, as a pragmatist, we start off by asking, what's the point of quantum states? What is their function? And the main function of a quantum state assignment, or assigning a quantum state, is to yield probabilities by the Born rule. Probabilities of what? Well, probabilities of magnitude claims, I think, where a magnitude claim about a system, S, asserts that the value of magnitude M on S lies in Borel set delta of real numbers. So if you legitimately apply a quantum state, or the Born rule to a quantum state, you'll end up with a probability for such a magnitude claim. But the word legitimately is not in there um, just for fun, as we'll see, because uh, there are lots of illegitimate applications of the Born rule also. So what you have to do, if you're an agent, to apply quantum theory is to assign a quantum state and apply the Born rule. So what, what is it to accept quantum theory? It's to adopt the credence as pro so prescribed in the absence of more direct access to the truth or falsity of the magnitude claim these concern. Now, you might have thought that accepting quantum theory was believing that it's true. Uh, and my claim is that, yes, believing that it's true is be going into the same cognitive state that you'll be in if you uh, adopt the prescribed credences. So there's no uh, conflict between the natural understanding of what it is to accept quantum theory and what I just said. Quantum state assignment is an objective matter. It's not just up to you. Um, prevailing physical conditions determine what quantum state, if any, is correctly assigned to a system. And those are the state's backing conditions. Um, 
you know, they might be described as what was done to prepare that quantum state. But I think quantum states have backing conditions even when nobody is trying to prepare them. I think we can assign quantum states legitimately to bits of the universe that nobody's in a position to uh, prepare, um, like the cause of neutron stars and the very early universe when there was no one around to prepare anything. Um, in any case, backing conditions, I think, may be taken to supervene on or be determined by significant magnitude claims about some physical systems, frequently not the system to which the state is assigned. You need to describe the, um, the slits separation in a, a, an experiment preparing a quantum state, uh, not just describe, uh, in fact, not at all describe the electron whose state is being assigned. OK, but this is another important point. Quantum states are relational. Sometimes differently situated agents assign different quantum states to the very same system in the very same circumstances. So it's really not good to say a system is in a quantum state or has a quantum state, because different agents can assign it different quantum states perfectly consistently. Conditions backing assignment of a quantum state have to be accessible from the physical situation of an agent. So if agents are in sufficiently different physical situations, Naturally, they have access to different information about backing conditions, and therefore, they will assign different quantum states. And that means that the Born rule can give an individual event more than one chance at the same time in an inertial frame. And we'll see how this works out in uh, the usual case by focusing on uh, violation of Bell inequalities from an entangled state like this Bell state. So I said before that we can get chances from the Born rule, or more precisely, modified Lewisian chances from the Born rule. So suppose that Alice and Bob are space-like separated, and they want to figure out the chance that a photon detected by Alice will register as vertically polarized. So here's Alice. Her de detector is, is or is not clicking in region one of space-time. In the future light cone of region one, there's going to be some pictures in a minute to clue you in exactly what's going on here. Uh, in the future light cone of region one where Alice's detector has clicked, she shouldn't use the Born rule. She doesn't need to. She already knows that chance is either zero or one. And if she's on her toes, she's found out whether the detector has clicked or which detector has clicked for a two-channel polarizer. But at P in the past light cone of region one, she can and should use the Born rule to figure out the chance, if she knows the Bell state as well as the polarizer setting little a. And in that case, the Born rule gives you the chance. Now, what's going on here in notation is that VA is a concrete event of registration of a vertically polarized photon. Big VA is characterizing a type of event. So big letters means types, small letters means tokens. Um, little a, little b are the polarizer settings on Alice's side and Bob's side. And this is how we apply the Born rules to figure out the chance at space-time point P of Alice's uh, registration being a registration of a vertically polarized photon. Now, she didn't need to know Bob's setting to apply the Born rule. And she couldn't know Bob's outcome because it's out then outside her past light cone. What about Bob? What chance does he assign to the very same event? Well, after Alice's outcome lies in his past light cone, he should do the same thing that Alice did, namely assign it chance one if it happened to be vertically polarized, or zero if it was horizontally polarized. At P primed in the past light cone of the region where his detector clicks, Bob should assign VA chance a half for the same reasons as Alice. He has access to the same relevant information at that point. But the interesting thing is what happens when event two enters his past light cone at a, a, a point Q. Now we can use the Born rule to infer that the chance of VA is no longer a half. He can do that in either of two ways. He can do it, first of all, um, by conditioning on his, the nature of his own outcome. And it turns out, as you all know, that in that case, the chance that he will end up assigning is the square of the cosine of the angle between his uh, detector setting analysis. But he could do it a different way. That was an assignment based on the original um, entangled state. But now, given his outcome, he can update his quantum state. He can reassign Alice's photon uh, a quantum state, uh, essentially the state I've indicated as VB here. 
Um, and that state will give him the same result. Uh, but now he's applied it to a different. Uh, he, he's applied the Born rule to a different quantum state to arrive at that result. Now, some people might think, "Ah, so the wave function has collapsed." No, that's that's the wrong way to think about what's going on here. Wave functions don't collapse. They're not the kind of physical thing that could collapse. Um, what's going on is that Bob's simply reassigning correctly uh, a quantum state to Alice's photon based on his awareness of new backing conditions. So what this gives you is something rather interesting. You know, we tend to think that quantum theory is an indeterministic theory, but if we think rather carefully about what that means, um, we see that that's not quite right to, uh, the right way of looking at things. Suppose we look at the, the ideal case with the polarizers perfectly aligned. Um, now, Bell says that when they're perfectly aligned, Alice's outcome is predetermined. But that's only true relative to space-time point Q here. OK, because at space-time point Q, the chance of Alice getting a vertically polarized um, registration is now 1, or 0 if it, that had been HB rather than VB. But relative to space-time points P and P prime, the one we talked about earlier, the chance is still the same. Also relative to point R, and points P, R, and Q all occur at the same time. Those space-time points are simultaneous in the lab frame. So what is the chance at that time that Alice will get vertically polarized? There's no such thing. There are three different, or actually two different relativized chances, relativized to any point which is not inside the light, just inside the light cone. The chance is a half. Relative to a point that is just inside the future light cone of region two, the chance is either one or zero. Um, so, Quantum theory is sort of indeterministic and sort of deterministic, depending on how you look at it. Um, and it's not a good idea to ask for a straight answer to an ambiguous question. OK, now let's look at common cause explanations. Jeff thinks we can understand how non-local correlations arise in our quantum world if we recognize intrinsic randomness as a primitive feature of quantum systems, not requiring further explanation. Now, as Jeff himself says, intrinsic randomness is a tricky concept. And I spent uh, a considerable amount of time trying to figure out what exactly it came to, um, and essentially gave up uh, for the purposes of this talk, because it would uh, involve a, a long digression. But in any case, the p important point here is that Jeff and a lot of other people take Bell's argument to have ruled out any explanation by a common cause without instantaneous action at a distance. When reaching that conclusion, Jeff makes two common assumptions that I think we should question. The first one is that correlations with a common cause are conditionally statistically independent with respect to the common cause. Now, you can make that true by definition. This is what I mean by a common cause. But why would you come up with that definition in the first place if you didn't have some prior beliefs about what should constitute a common cause? And if you look back to the, those prior beliefs, you'll see that it's not necessary that um, correlations with a common cause in this intuitive sense be conditionally statistically independent with respect to the common cause. So that's an option that should be explored. Secondly, the joint conditional probability is factorizable. That's basically the same thing. This is Bell's locality condition. Well, is it? Is that Bell's locality condition? Perhaps in his earlier statements, um, it was statements of the principle of what he calls local causality. But by the time he gets to la, la nouvelle cuisine, his latest and best formulation of his argument, that is not Bell's locality condition. That's supposed to follow from Bell's locality condition of local causality. So that means that in Bell's argument, there are actually two interesting steps that need to be queried. In deriving the factorizability of joint conditional probabilities from the local, local causality he based on an intuitive causal principle, there's two steps. Intuitive principle to formal statement of local causality, formal statement of local causality to uh, factorizability of joint conditional probabilities. And both of those steps, they don't work well together, I think. So I'm going to maintain the uh, apparently still radical thesis that quantum theory itself may be used to explain EPR Bohm and other non localized correlations in terms of non factorizable common causes without instantaneous action at a distance. 
So let's get down to some details. This is Bell's latest and best formulation of local causality. There's going to be a picture in a minute that tells you where these regions 1, 2, and 3 are. Most of you probably already know what it's going to be lo looking like. Uh, but if, if it's difficult from the words to figure out what this means, the pictures later will make it easier. A theory, notice he's talking about theories. Are theories locally causal or not? He's not talking about the world at all. A theory will be said to be locally causal if the probabilities attached to values of local beables in space-time region 1 are unaltered by specification of values of local beables in a space-like separated region 2 when what happens in the backward light cone of 1 is already sufficiently specified. For example, by a full specification of local beables in a space-time region 3. That's to say a thick slice that fully closes the backward light cone of region 1, wholly outside the backward light cone of region 2. So here's the picture. We've got regions 1, 2. The quote, actually, or, of local causality, 3 in that quote becomes 3a, just this little bit here. But in the application, region 3 has been extended to a space-like um, slice right across the backward light cones of regions 1 and 2, and wholly covering the overlap of the backward light cones of those two regions. And little a and little b are last minute events selecting the detector setting for Alice and the detector setting for Bob. And they're also space-like separated from each other and from the uh, outcome at the distant location. OK. Lambda is the local beable. What's the local beable? Well, he's talking about uh, a, uh, a class of theories, which are theories of local beables. And that, of course, raises the question as to whether quantum theory is a theory of local beables. Um, it's natural to think, well, surely at least the wave function is a local beable, isn't it? Well, it's not exactly local, but it's a beable, isn't it? But that's what I began by denying. So what are the beables of quantum theory? It's not clear that there are any. Um, so if there aren't any, then can we apply this condition? Well, yeah, vacuously. If there aren't any local beables, then we apply the condition on the assumption that the set of local beables is null. OK, so let's get back to the wording here. The key point is unaltered. And the next point to worry about is the phrase, the probabilities. So which probabilities are you talking about? And what would it be to alter those probabilities? I think the relevant probabilities should be chances. The chance that Alice will register her photon as vertically polarized at P or P prime, we already figured out that was a half. Is that altered by specification of Bob's setting or outcome? No, not at all. Uh, nor is the chance of Alice's outcome at Q. That's not altered either. What we do know is that this conditional general probability, which is not itself a statement about, cause, about uh, chances at all, but something from which we may or may not be able to derive chances, that conditional probability is unequal to the uh, unconditional probability. Is either of those two things the probability of VA? I want to say no. These are general born probabilities. They don't talk about a specific event at all. We have to apply the general born probabilities to calculate chances. And moreover, neither of them is altered by specification of uh, Bob's setting or outcome. So if we go back to the intuitive principle um, of, on which the formal condition of local causality was based, what matters is whether uh, the chance of something gets altered in the sense that it would have been different had certain other conditions been different. So it's a counterfactual alteration we're talking about there. And I want to claim that a causal dependence between the outcomes at Bob's analysis detector setting requires the following. It requires that the chance of um, a particular whoops, sorry, event um, being registered by Alice, given that the event registered by Bob is the outcome of an intervention, be different um, from what the chance would have been if there had not been such an intervention. So I'm relying now on a notion of causation, which is becoming increasingly popular in uh, various circles. Uh, in uh, applications to causal modeling, uh, this is 
uh, Pearl's notion of an intervention. Uh, Jim Woodward, in his book, tried to explain exactly what he took an intervention to be. But the important point is that in assessing causal counterfactuals, the relevant um, counterfactual scenario is always going to be a scenario when some intervention has or, not, has or has not occurred. It's not going to be a scenario in which things just happen. So it works out that way. OK. So what we really need to know, the, the worrying kind of alteration, is this kind of alteration. But once we see that's what we should be worrying about, we see there's no reason to be worried at all. There couldn't be any superluminal causation here, because that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense because we don't have a coherent notion of an intervention uh, in Bob's region that brings it about that his outcome is EB. Um, and here's where I'd like to actually get some help from Jeff. I would like to be able to say that's an intrinsically random event, but I'm not quite sure yet what that means. So, so uh, maybe we'll come back to that. In any case, the fact that the conditional and unconditional general probabilities uh, derived from the Born rule directly um, are unequal, that doesn't establish causal dependence. OK. So Bell, Bell derives local causality in the sense now, sorry, he takes his condition of local causality to involve or to, to um, imply two players of probabilistic independence claims from which this condition of factorizability on a local hidden variable theory, um, local theory of local beables, um, uh, is committed to. Now, I already said that quantum theory posits no local beables in region three, but what we can do is to apply the Born rule to yield these joint and individual outcome probabilities, which don't factorize, which is kind of like factorizability, even though um, we're treating phi plus uh, in a way uh, now in which we've agreed that it is not actually a local beable. So in that sense, Q factorizability, factorizability does fail in quantum theory. It's a good thing, too, because that's the condition you need mathematically to prove things like the Klaasohn Shimoni Holt inequality, which uh, fails. The fact that Q factorizability fails does not single, signal a violation of local causality in any um, um, justifiable form, and it's no manifestation of superluminal causal dependence. OK, so. There's not a problem with uh, instantaneous action to distance, but can we actually explain these correlations by applying quantum theory? That question has not yet been answered. Well, what are we trying to do? What are the explanandum phenomena? Certain particular correlations realizable according to quantum mechanics. That's what we're trying to explain. And I take these to be general patterns of probabilistic correlation that first of all are implied by the Born rule in the way we've uh, indicated. And secondly, provide an excellent fit to experimentally observe statistics, which, in fact, they do. So what do we want of an explanation? I take it that, that Jeff somehow wants to say, don't ask for an explanation. Once you've noticed that there's intrinsic randomness in the world, you don't feel the need for an explanation. I want to keep on going. I want to actually give an explanation. And I want to use quantum theory to do it. Well, the first thing we need is to show that the explanandum phenomena were to be expected. Well, they are. I mean, I showed you why, <laughs> essentially. Um, but that's not enough, right? Uh, we need to, to give an explanation. It's not enough to show that the explanandum phenomena were to be expected. We've got to do more. We have to show, I think, what they depend on. And one natural sense of dependence is causal dependence. Can quantum theory help us to meet that requirement, too? Yes, it can. Um, if we focus on a particular photon pair that registers those types of outcomes with polarizers set much earlier, so I've switched the settings now to an earlier setting just to make things a bit simpler, and we call the registration events in 1 and 2, EA and EB, and the event of their joint occurrence, I found this wonderful symbol on uh, my uh, keyboard. Uh, I'll leave it up to you how to read that symbol. Uh, I suppose if I were a metaphysician, I would say the fusion of. Um, in any case, the claim is that this thing is a well-defined event, which is assigned a, a well-defined probability by a legitimate application of the Born rule. It's the event that occurs if and only if EA occurs and EB occurs. So let's look at a point outside the future light cones of those events, EA and EB, but within the future light cone of the, uh, what you can think of as the preparation event of uh, 
state phi plus. And all of the chances I'm going to be talking about are chances relative to or from the perspective of that space-time point. <laughs> so if we apply the Born rule to that state, we get these chances. The chance of each of Ea and Eb individually is a half. The chance of the, chance of the, the fusion event is a half cos squared Ab. Um, and this is what we get if we apply quantum theory. The event E, the preparation event, affects all of those chances. If you'd had a different state prepared, then you'd have got different um, chances. Now notice here, it makes perfect sense to speak of an agent altering um, or intervening to make E be the case or be not the case. Um, that just corresponds to a different preparation event, which we're perfectly capable of uh, organizing. Um, so we get these inequalities now. Inequalities are the right kind to infer a causal relation because they're interventionist counterfactuals now. Um, and we see that since all of these three hold, we can conclude that both EA and EB and also the, the fusion event are all causally dependent on the preparation event. E is a common cause of EA and EB that doesn't screen off events of these types from one another. And the same thing applies to every individual photon pair. So we have a, 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 indeed satisfied the second requirement on explanation. We've got the right kind of dependence relation in here. Dependence of the individual events um, along with um, derivation of the probabilistic phenomena which they may or may not, and we hope they do, manifest. Okay, is that local? Well, it doesn't involve any superluminal causal dependence, or so I've argued. It doesn't involve any violation of local causality. Once you really look into the details of what local causality says and what motivates it. So perhaps I should say more precisely, it involves no violation of a um, intuitively motivated formulation of local causality. We can say that the quantum chances to which it appeals are, in a sense, localized, because um, we've relativized all the uh, attributions of chance to space-time points, and that, you can't get more local than that, or um, no localized, anyway. Um, and the point of doing that was because we're thinking of them as hypothetical momentary locations of an idealized agent whose credences they guide. So we're going right back to what, why we cared about probabilities and chances in the first place. But I'm not claiming everything is uh, exactly what you might have wanted. There's now going to be a tension with the first part of Bell's intuitive local locality principle, which I state now for the first time. This is where he begins, and then he wants to move on because he finds all this talk about causes very uh, fuzzy and wants to move on to something which he thinks of as more precise, namely talk about probabilities. It's not clear to me that it is any more precise, but that's what he thinks anyway. The direct causes and effects of events are nearby, and even the indirect causes and effects are no further away than permitted by the velocity of light. Well, the last clause, the one that got us worried about superluminal causation, we've handled that, but the first clause we're still in trouble with. It's not true that the causes to which I've appealed, namely the, essentially the preparation event, is nearby both of the individual localized um, detection events. It might, by chance, be near to one of them in some reference frame, but then it won't be near the other. So it can't be near both of them. So the story I've told you doesn't satisfy that con first clause. Um, well, maybe um, you th think, uh, at least it's not in the explanation I've given you is not incompatible with satisfying the first clause. There just might be something else that we would f help to fill in between the indirect cause and the uh, effects of that indirect cause. Uh, well, good luck on that. Quantum theory won't help you. Um, and I think you're going to have a lot of trouble uh, coming up with an alternative theory that would help you. So in that sense, yeah, it's not local. Okay, um, I'm going to skip over this part um, in the interest of time and get, finish up by saying a little bit about information. If you want me to say something about the measurement problem, I'd be very happy to do so, but um, I think that will be a bit of a distraction from the course I've chosen to take here. I even have some rambling thoughts on intrinsic randomness right at the end, if anybody's interested. OK. So as Jeff recognizes, anybody proposing an information theoretic interpretation of quantum theory is likely to be asked Bell's famous questions. Whose information? Information about what? Jeff dismisses these questions, appealing to their irrelevance when asked of a 64 gig <coughs> USB drive. 
But I think he'd do better to actually answer them, because he can. Um, and this is what I would suggest by way of an answer. The information supplied by a legitimate application of the Born rule to a quantum state is about the magnitude claims to which the rule assigns probabilities. That's what it's about. Now, in a particular context, you might want to uh, attribute additional significance to those uh, claims about the values of magnitude. You might take them to code something like um, a, a factor, a prime factor of a very large number for various information theoretic purposes. But at least you can say at ground level what quantum theory itself, or, or what the information supplied by the Born rule is information about. Well, whose information is it? It's the information that quantum theory supplies to any actual or merely hypothetical agent in a physical situation from which this is the correct quantum state assignment. So that's the objective um, uh, advice that quantum theory is giving anybody who happens to be in a position to make use of it. So we do have answers to Bell's questions. Whose information? The information of an actual hypothetical agent in a specific physical situation. Information about what? Information about magnitude claims. So what kind of information is this? It's not technical information. It's not Shannon information or Schumacher information or anything like that. Um, in those answers, the word information is used in its ordinary semantic sense. And I kind of like this metaphor. In this sense, a quantum state may be said to provide an informational bridge between its backing conditions and the advice conditions prescribing how strongly to believe the magnitude claims concerned. By making such bridges available to any agent in the relevant physical situation, quantum theory's probabilistic correlations help us predict, control, and understand, I stress that third thing, our world. But only in this metaphorical sense is quantum mechanics a theory of information, in my view. Okay. So um, I'll stop early, and I'd be very happy to say more about the measurement problem or, uh, and some rather incoherent remarks about intrinsic randomness, if you'd like to hear that. But it's up to you what you want to talk about. Yes. That they said that there couldn't be common cause because common cause has to have a separate mechanism uh, that bring about, and in the EPR there isn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems to me that if that's the case, you have to come up with another notion of a common cause. And the only one other person that tried to do it is Nancy Cartwright mm -hmm. in the paper that, or chapter that's called Logical Metrics Can Teach One right. Mechanics. And in my view, it totally failed. Right. So my question is, do you have any <coughs> well, suggestion for how to resolve I'm not sure that um, the, the line that uh, Woodward and Housen were taking in that paper is the right line to take in response to this difficulty. I don't think you should be looking for mechanisms of the, the kind that, according to you anyway, they were looking for to, to resolve this issue and failing to find them, concluded it couldn't be a common cause. Um, it seems to me that um, I'm going to have to take issue 
with uh, their analysis of this situation. I do remember when reading that paper a long time ago that they also wanted to argue that there was no possibility of intervention um, on the individual events. Yeah. Uh, and I agree with that, uh, although I don't quite agree with the way they reached that conclusion. Um, but I, I think that the right thing to do is to give an alternative uh, story about uh, what an interventionist counterfactual requires of this scenario that doesn't look for mechanisms connecting um, potential common causes to um, individual um, uh, joint effects. Okay, yes, please do. Because um, this so is interesting. My mechanism is metaphorical. I mean, yeah. Basically, what uh, Giuseppe and all the people would do, I mean, it's, it's like uh, having certain, uh, you know, screening off. Or, okay. Or, so it's not really mechanism in mm -hmm, any mm -hmm. strong way. What they, according to their view, there cannot be a common cause because you cannot have intervention in such a situation. Right. Because you cannot have an intervention that would stop the common cause causing one of the effects and still have the common cause causing the other. So it means that it's basically vacuous for the EPR case. And so what my challenge is that you cannot rely on the account because the account says that okay. there cannot be such common cause. Okay, so obviously uh, they reach a conclusion based on their interventionist account, which I want to reject. So I need to um, modify their interventionist account so as to avoid re uh, reaching that unfortunate conclusion. And that's the line I want to take. Uh, and it would be very useful to talk to you afterwards uh, about the details so I can get straight on what's required here. Um, but I, I, I'm quite confident that an alternative <laughs> interventionist account could deliver the goods on this issue at the moment. But you started to in insert some, some worries. Thank you. Matt raised a finger. Yeah, so I have like very cool questions related. Could you to, wait, could you speak up? Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I, I have a technical question that's related to that, which is to do with your use of the Bluetooth visuals. Yes. Um, so my understanding of the Pearl and um, the way you define the Bluetooth conditional is you first of all have a factorization. You first of all have a, a distribution that satisfies. Mm -hmm. And then, when you're defining the do conditional, you remove all the edges that okay. are going into the right, space. right, right. So, if you don't accept the cause of one of your conditions, mm -hmm. how can you even define what, what those do conditionals that you already have are? Good question. I will address it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but clearly, I, I'm not going to require the uh, factorizability condition before even starting to um, worry about do um, conditional. Okay, I, I, I mean, it's just a question about how am I supposed to interpret those equations that you wrote down? Okay. Um, well, I could adopt a, a novel terminology instead of adapting uh, or co opting an existing terminology, which seems to re uh, require things that I don't want. Um, we'll have a different terminology. I, mean, I could put it in words. As a result of an intervention, then I owe you an account of what an intervention is, and that's what I go on to try to give. Yep. Okay, James, next. Sorry, next. No? Okay. Gentlemen, you have to take it. Thank you. Um, I have two. Uh, one is uh, what are the uh, implications of you using the word agent instead of observer? And uh, I think that uh, one's ontological claim uh, about intrinsic randomness is key to what follows. So I would like to hear you talk about that a little bit. OK. Um, agent. Well, why not just observer? Uh, well, the concept of probability, and especially the concept of causation, are intimately connected to the concept of an agent. Um, it's only from an agent's perspective that we care about causation. Um, it, it's only because we are agents that we've come up with this concept in the first place. Um, it's not built into the physical world independent of us. Um, and similarly, the reason why we, rather than um, you know, God outside of time, needs a, a concept of probability 
is because we're stuck in the middle of things and there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about and can't know about for various reasons. That's why we need a concept of probability. Um, and since I've talked so much about causation and probability, it's important always to relate it back to the roots of those concepts, which is in the, uh, uh, the notion of an agent. Okay. Um, in the context of this workshop, it's pretty obvious why we need to be talking about agents, because uh, we're talking all the time about applications, information theoretic applications of quantum theory. And these are always applications which are made by agents. Um, in talking about it, trying to understand quantum theory. Quantum theory is a, a theory that we have constructed, and we are agents. And it's useful because we, as agents, can apply it to do various things. So the concept of an agent is central here. And the concept of an observer doesn't exhaust uh, the concept of an agent, because observers could be merely passive um, creatures that never do anything, like uh, Michael Dummett's intelligent trees. Um, that doesn't give us enough richness to set the conceptual foundations of talking about probability and causation. OK, so that's a lot of general philosophical stuff, right? Um, more concretely, um, we don't need to think of quantum theory as being a theory of agents. That's a mistake. Um, quantum theory is a theory about uh, probabilistic correlations. Okay? Uh, but probabilistic correlations are the kinds of things that are only interesting to, uh, to agents of one kind or another. They don't have to be human agents. Um, they have to have a certain degree of cognitive um, sophistication. Um, you know, amoebae are not agents. Um, but uh, we could certainly tell stories about aliens who have the capacity to uh, count as agents. And they should use quantum theory if they haven't developed something better by then. Um, but um, OK, maybe that's enough. If there's a follow-up, I'd be happy to address it. Uh, well, you're, you're, you are counter to Wheeler's position, basically, that the observer is the key. So uh, from, from his, uh, his interpretation, it becomes a, an, an observer theoretic mm -hmm. uh, information theory. Yeah. Well, two points about that. Um, probably you're right. Um, Wheeler's a little bit uh, hard to pin down sometimes. Um, but. Uh, I don't think that quantum theory is primarily a theory that helps us predict the results of observations. It does do that, but that's not primarily what it is. Um, because to take that line is to take for granted the notion of an observation. Um, and I think that Bell's um, sort of arguments against uh, any precise formulation of fundamental physical theory, making use of words like observer or measurement or observation, those are good arguments. Uh, we don't want to formulate quantum theory in those terms. If we don't want to formulate it in those terms, then uh, when we bring things like observation and agency in, that's going to be after we already understand what quantum theory is saying, uh, to tie it in with our important reasons for getting quantum theory to say those kinds of things. Uh, it's not going to be fundamental to the formulation of the theory. And the intrinsic randomness? Um, okay, well, I'll just say about that, a bit about that. Um, so this is more a question of puzzlement, I think. Um, but it'll be useful to have it on the table right at the start of the conference anyway. Um, For a pair, this is what Jeff says intrinsic randomness is. And when I first read it, I thought, oh, he means indeterminism. But then I read it again and thought, no, he can't mean that. For a pair of entangled photons, the measurement outcomes can be shown to be intrinsically random with respect to the preparation event, in the sense that they are uncorrelated with any event that is not in the future light cone of the preparation event, so independent of any event that the preparation event couldn't have caused. Okay? So, so here's a picture. right? Uh, what the same uh, registration events by Alice and Bob, E, A, and E, B, in the space-like separated regions 1 and 2, and E is the preparation event. What are S and T now? Those are space-time points outside of the future light cone of E, um, but inside 
the backlight cones of regions 1 and 2. So the claim seems to be that EA is intrinsically random because it's independent of events like S and T. Um, but that struck me as being very strange. I mean, how could it be independent of S and T? Uh, for example, suppose S is an event which <coughs> brings up a big barrier uh, which prevents, um, which deflects certain of the photons which were headed for region one. Um, well, that could change the probability of an event in region one. Um, suppose T, uh, on the other hand, does the same thing for region two. Or even more dramatically, suppose S and T are um, locations of potential button presses, such that you press buttons at those locations, following which um, the photons which were headed for regions one and two uh, are brought, brought back into convergence and interact in such a way as to effectively reprepare the initial quantum state, say into the state VV. Okay? That would definitely change the probabilities at, uh, in regions one and region two of those events. So, um, it seemed to me very strange that anything could count as being intrinsically random here. Um, so how, how could it not? Well, if you fix that the preparation event is the last time you lay hands on those photons, then maybe um, this will work out. Maybe we will get a case of intrinsic randomness here from just definition. But if we do that, then isn't that sort of a cheat? Um, because the light cone structure tells us there's all kinds of ways we could have, have um, changed the probabilities of EA and EB in regions one and two. Um, to just to stress the difference between intrinsic randomness and indeterminism, look at what Bell said about local determinism, which is the condition he started from in developing his formulation of local causality. Um, he, he gives Maxwell's theory as an instance of a locally deterministic theory. All you have to do is fix what's going on in this spatial volume that wholly encloses the backward light cone of region one, and then anything else that happens anywhere else, like at S or T, is simply irrelevant. Okay? Um, so a theory could, in my view, if I've got it right, uh, be both locally deterministic and such that an event in region one is intrinsically random. Maxwell's theory is not like that, but a theory could be. Um, so this is clearly not the same thing as indeterminism. And at this point, I sort of scratch my head and, and wonder about what the uh, significance of intrinsic randomness um, defined in this way uh, is going to be. Um, on the other hand, I know that Jeff refers to a lot of really interesting papers um, concerning this, and in reading those papers, I'm still trying to figure it out. Those are my uh, rambling remarks on intrinsic randomness. Jeff, you want uh, to say something yeah, to clarify? Well, um, yeah, the, the, the of intrinsic randomness I got from Kovic and Ray. Yes, those are the papers I've been struggling and, through. Um, and I cite those papers, but the idea is, uh, well, they, Perhaps it's simplest just to, to talk about the idea in terms of um, PR boxes or mm -hmm. PR bananas, but I'll just talk about PR boxes. So if you just have the definition of the PR box that um, is uh, as follows, that you know, there, there are two inputs for Alice, two inputs for Bob, so for two inputs, uh, I mean for a, a particular pair of inputs for Alice and Bob, the outcomes are opposite, and for all the other Is the outputs are the same. Mm -hmm. Now, if you then, so that you take that as sort of the definition of the PR box, and then ask about the margins. Now, if you assume no signaling, then the marginals are all a half. Right. Uh, and you can also show very simply that a conditional on anything uh, before mm -hmm. the creation of the, uh, of the pair of bananas or the PR box, uh, the probabilities are also. Right. So the properties are half kind the, the so uh, they don't depend on anything that came before right, right, right. in any reference, right? right. And a, a more complicated proof will show the same thing. Right. That that part of your book I read so, and understood. So that's an <laughs> of intrinsically random, intrinsically yes. random in the sense that um, 
If it is intrinsically at random, intuitively, if it doesn't depend on anything, then yeah. Right. You have to be a little bit critical about, you know, the whole what. And so if you're talking about mm -hmm. entangled states or something, uh, it, it has to be before the space time event. Um, right. Because if, which in this case, it's before the preparation of the entangled yep. state. So after, you do assume that after the preparation of the entangled state, you didn't do anything to, to say. Right, right. So, so I mean, Essentially, what you're saying, I think, is that the PR box structure is fixed. You can't mess with that. Yeah. And that's analogous to saying that my event E is fixed. You can't re-prepare the quantum state. Right. You can't st right. send the photons off to Alpha Centauri instead of hitting the detector. You can't do that kind of thing. Um, and that may be true, but I'm just not quite sure um, how that ties. It doesn't really tie up at all closely with indeterminism. Right. I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, the whole, I'll talk about this this afternoon, uh, but um, for me, the whole thing that's puzzling about quantum mechanics, or new and interesting, is the fact that uh, it's a theory of, a, of correlations where the events that are correlated are intrinsically random. Right. That's the, the new thing. Right. Intrinsically random. Could you just speak up a little bit, Jeff? Um, I'm saying that, so the intrinsic randomness for me sort of is, is, the, is the crucial thing. You know, I would say that uh, you know, Schrodinger says uh, entanglement is, is, is the feature of quantum mechanics that uh, uh, makes it different from uh, classical theories. Well, the thing about entanglement that's really interesting is the fact that the entangled events are intrinsically random in the sense that they independent of anything. That's what I think is, is the essentially new and fascinating and puzzling thing about uh, quantum events. James, do you have? Yeah, um, this is a different uh, question. Good. Can you uh, speak up? Okay. It's about the scope of your pragmatism and your skepticism about the field. So the first question is whether the pragmatism is a general thesis about physics or whether it's specific to quantum mechanics. And then, <coughs> The second question is whether you think that spin of a particle is a big one, even if you think that the wave function of a particle mm -hmm. isn't. So um, the motivation question, I guess, is something you, you said just a minute ago and applied to something else, is that quantum theory is about a theory about quantum correlations. And I mean, one might say, well, yeah, it's a theory that that makes that has things to say about the physical correlation, but, but it's obviously about a lot more. In particular, one might say it's a theory about the mechanics of subatomic particles. It's a theory about the structure of orbits in atoms in mm -hmm. the first instance, um, and it's a theory with physical content about physical properties. And in the end, in the classical limit, it's a theory about the aggregate behavior of software particles that we describe in classical physics. So, uh, yeah, I guess I, I want to know whether you think that spin is a viable even mm -hmm. wave function. I think components of spin are viable, for sure. Um, spin itself, I haven't, I haven't really figured out an answer to that one. Um, I would like to say it is, but, but there are uh, reasons why I sometimes thought that is not a good thing to say. Um, uh, as an analogy in a closely related case, um, do I think being a fermion is uh, beable, or being a boson? Um, I think I'm on record as saying no <laughs> to that question. But being a fermion and having half integral spin are awfully close. Uh, so it'd be a bit difficult to deny that being a fermion is a, a beable type property, uh, whereas having half integral spin is not. Okay. Okay, that's really interesting. Then someone might think, well, if you reject that the wave function is beable, but you think that the properties that are described by the wave function... I don't think the wave function describes properties. The properties that we use the wave function to make predictions okay. are beables. Then it seems like Lots of people would then want to say, well, why don't we have 
like uh, hidden variables theory that will actually describe. Okay, you know, okay. Now that this is where it gets interesting. That comes back to the first part of your question: how how general is this pragmatism? Well, there's one feature of the pragmatism which is very general, and that's the pragmatist inferentialism that I use to um, talk about when it's legitimate to apply the Born rule. See, I don't want to say you're only allowed to apply the Born rule to measurement contexts, because then I'm stuck talking about measurement, right? I want to say you're allowed to apply, or it's legitimate to apply the Born rule whenever the magnitude claim to, claims to which you want to apply it have uh, sufficiently well-defined content. So what is it for a claim to have sufficiently well-defined content? Well, from a pragmatist inferentialist point of view, it's for that claim to um, play uh, a role in an inferential web, um, linking it to lots of other claims, such that um, those inferences are um, individually and collectively reliable. They're sort of good material inferences in a sense. Okay. So um, what makes those inferences reliable in certain contexts, but not in other contexts? Well, it's the environment. It's the environment in which you uh, want to uh, make a magnitude claim, say about the position of an electron, um, that's going to determine what magnitude claims about that electron um, have sufficient content for you to be uh, allowed uh, to apply the Born rule to them. And that's where decoherence is going to come in. Environmental decoherence is going to tell you, first of all, um, which magnitude claims are likely to have enough content for it to be legitimate to apply the Born rule to them and which don't. So it'll give you the selection uh, that you need once you know that you can't consistently attribute born rule probabilities to all magnitude claims because of Cauchy and Specker type stuff. We need selection. Decoherence is going to do the selection. And the reason this works is because decoherence is telling you via pragmatist inferentialism um, which magnitude claims have well-defined content. OK. So that's a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> um, so ba back to these magnitude claims. Why don't you want a hidden variable theory telling you what those magnitudes are doing when you're not looking or whatever? OK. Well, given what I said about those magnitude claims, um, it's not quite right to think of them in the, the straightforward, you know, realist correspondence uh, way that one does, that the claim is true just in case it corresponds to the world, right? Because the content of the claim is itself um, um, sort of a function of the environment. Uh, and so um, even magnitude claims are not really, in the strong realist correspondence sense, um, um, beable claims. Okay? And if once you've given up on that, you think, well, maybe it was a bad way to think about the success of quantum theory to suppose that we need to have a theory that tells us what the real beables are doing. Um, and that that theory itself is going to be uh, either close to or an interpretation of quantum theory. Okay. Um, now, all of this stuff is quite consistent with some radical future development, which will get us back to a good old um, um, correspondence sense realist uh, theory of the world. Um, it's just that quantum theory seems to be pushing us in a different direction here. Okay. Um, I could say more, but th th that's probably enough. <laughs> yeah. um, I see, I'd like to ask you a bit more about um, what you said about that locality and common cause. Yeah. Um, let me try and talk up. So you gave a very nice, subtle analysis of common cause and that locality. Um, and I, I, it, it was, it, 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 some point I was in my head, so I'd have to read it through. But I, I want to try and. Um, See if I can get you to just comment to sort of a simple formulation of what I yes. see as a puzzling feature of the entanglement. So Alice and Bob share an entangled state. Alice makes a measurement. She gets a particular result. She's now in a position. She now knows something about Bob's system which um, she didn't know before, which wasn't the case before, because she's done something and now she's found out the natural result that uh, now she can say, well, you know, spin is up or something. So uh, as Gisan says, um, if Alice knows something, mm -hmm. then nature knows something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If nature knows something, uh, something has changed. Nature knows something right, right, right. that wasn't before putting it in that way. So if one wants to say, well, you know, Alice did something and instantaneously changed something mm -hmm. above it, 
But on the other hand, you have no signaling, so it right. looks like there wasn't any change. Um, so is, is there a change or isn't there a change? Now, I want to say that there is no change. And so do I. So do you. But um, it's, uh, it's not so easy to say that there's no change because it seems that mm -hmm. one has to meet you know, G-SAS comment. Yes, but what's yes. The nature of change? Right. No, that's um, a, and so hmm. I just wonder if you could say something that addresses the Yeah, I think I can. I, I think Gisanne's comment is, um, is badly um, addressed to this issue. Um, the thought that once anybody knows, then the world knows. Um, but the world doesn't know anything. I mean, that's obviously true in a, in a, a superficial sense. But um, the picture you have in mind is that um, the state of the world has changed. And that picture goes with a Newtonian view of change. That time is progressing and the world is different now than what it was just then. <laughs> okay. But we don't have that notion of change in relativity. It's all going to be light cone dependent. So there can be something that counts as a change from, from the point of view of one space-time location, but not from the point of view of another location. And nature is not located anywhere. <laughs> uh, but change is in itself going to be a concept which has to be located. Okay. Um, is that a, a, an adequate answer? Uh, I, I don't think that you or he would be satisfied, but I, but I think you're sort of captured by a, a bad view of change, um, which is why you're pushing that question. Uh, yeah, no, it seems sort of quite difficult to say that there's been no change, and so I, I just what I didn't quite what I what I'm sort of hoping to give me sort of an intuitive overview of actually probably, but just yeah. which replies to that issue of why there has to be any change. Because I, 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 I mean, I, I, I agree that I, it's the right way to go here, but I didn't quite get the, uh, the way in which you argue for that. I mean, can you put it in a nutshell, or do I have to uh, go? Let me keep trying. Um, has there been change? That question has to be understood. Um, <coughs> in terms of a conception of uh, two distinct times, such that at the earlier time, this was the case. At the later time, that was the case. Um, uh, where that may or may not be the same as this. <laughs> okay. um, so how do we understand times? Well, if we understand times in terms of, um, sort of the backward light cone from various points along a time-like curve, then you know, if we take this time light curve, then there has been change. If we take that time light curve, there has not been change. Um, when? At a particular uh, time slice in an inertial frame. Okay? So the question, has there really been change, is a bad question. If it's demanding an answer um, which assumes what is not true, namely that the notion of change has to be relativized to um, a universal time. Okay. Is that making any progress? I mean, it may be difficult to give up that conception because obviously we, we apply it all the time in our daily life. But once we get used to relativity, we should realize we shouldn't ad uh, adopt that conception of change anymore. Okay. We're almost out of time, but Bill has a finger because only oh, only this very you, brief. If you put your light cone picture up, yeah, and then reset it, pointing to the Aspect of the picture, I think it would help to see where. Okay. See if I can get this thing going again. Uh, will this one help? Or do you want a different one? What, uh, I this like is the one where you had the line at the cone. Well, either, and whatever one you <laughs> think would work best. Um, okay, well, all right. Has, has anything changed? But, but, and I want to oh. look, we have an idea of clearly change has to be relativized to, uh, gi given relativity, we have to relativize it to, uh, to, to time slices. And so well, I'm suggesting that's not the right way okay. to relativize but it. But I want to see what, uh, yep. I mean, it, okay, so. But I think, I think Bell makes the same um, mistake. I don't want to accuse Bell of making a mistake. That's heresy. But um, he says explicitly um, that the result EA is predetermined 
at what we can think of as the time slice that cuts through PR and Q. Um, and I want to say, no, that's a mistake. Uh, you shouldn't be talking about uh, predetermination in terms of uh, time slices. Uh, you should be talking about predetermination um, with respect to um, various space-time points. I mean, an alternative, you could say, look, everything has to be relativized to the backward light cone of the relevant point. So there has been no change at P. Uh, has there been change at, uh, at Q? Um, well, yes. Um, so talking about change at a time uh, is not a good way of talking, where a time is understood to be a time slice. Is, is well, we're, there, there, there's more to be said, but we are, but there's also um, snacks to be had. So um, let's thank Richard and. <laughs>